thank you. It's uh, great to be here with you at uh, CSU. And uh, I used to speak a lot at Teen Leadership Conference. And uh, over the years, uh, I got some other assignments, and I haven't been here for 20 years. So I'm so glad to be back here with you uh, for this TLC 50-year celebration. Uh, very interesting that uh, just a few weeks ago, I was at my old high school uh, in Akron, New York. Anybody here from uh, Akron, New York? No, okay. Uh, oh, one, okay. Anyways, uh, celebrating my 50-year high school reunion. And then I thought it was right after that in the fall of 1969 that I came here to Baptist Bible College, uh, well, CSU now, Clark Summit University to be a student. And I'll tell you what, I, my wife and I, we just spent the morning walking around Jackson Hall and all these places that bring so many great memories to us. And, uh, you know, CSU was our home. It was our family. And I still feel that way when I come back. And, of course, I worked 13 years on staff here. Uh, back in those days, I used to travel all over the United States speaking at camps. I'd speak at sometimes eight to ten camps a summer. And TLC was always one of those camps. And, uh, Fred, that's when I came to speak at... Uh, at your at Skyview Ranch there and so I, I've had a blessed life I just thank God for um, after 10 years of being a pastor then I God called me back here and I got to travel all over speaking to young people and uh, I really enjoy it now some of you are staring at me and you're like now why would I get an old guy like this to speak to us okay so you know I know you, uh, and I, I've told my wife this morning I said I almost feel like I don't have the right to to preach to you this morning because you don't know me and you're kind of like, you know, who is this guy? What's he all about? Why would they bring an old guy like this? Well, uh, it's because of 50-year celebration. They want to bring an old, bring an old guy here. But anyways, um, um, sometimes what I do is I give you guys a chance to ask me any stupid question about my life so you can kind of get to know me a little bit. So anybody have a stupid question you'd like to ask me? Stupid question. Come on. Yes. Do I like Marvel or DC, right? Marvel or DC? I, I guess I like Marvel. Is that Superman? No, he's DC? I guess I like DC, I'm sorry. But I like Iron Man too, you know? Iron Man, yeah, yeah, yes. How old am I? I'm 67. Yes. <laughs> What's my middle name? David. Yeah, it's a good name. Yes, young lady. What's my favorite what? Dessert. Oh, dessert? You're going to think this is nuts, but I love green beans. <laughs> I, I don't like cake or, or sweet stuff, so on my birthday, my mom would make a big bowl of green beans with mushroom soup, and she would put candles in it. I'm not kidding you. And they would sing to me with a bowl of green bean casserole. Woo! I'm getting better than that. Okay, yes, right there. <laughs> What's my favorite Disney princess? Um, who's the blonde haired one in uh, Freeze? Frozen, I mean. <laughs> what, what's her name? Elsa. Elsa. I love Elsa. Woo! That's because my wife had long blonde hair when I fell in love with her at CSU. Okay, one here. How long have I been married? 45 years. Yeah. Okay. What's my favorite color? Probably blue. I like blue. Yeah. Okay, one, uh, one or two more. One over here. How many clothes do I have? Pose? I'm glad to tell you I have, ten. I have ten. Okay, one more way in the back there. What? What's my shoe size? Fifteen. Yes. I... Did you ever go to the shoe store and they have size sevens there on display and they look so cool? And I'm like, could I see that in a 15? And they, br they bring it out, you know. And it's like, uh, uh, you know. I can't look cool in that shoe, but anyways. 
All right, well, let's get into the Word of God. Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel 23. Now, probably 30 years ago when I spoke at TLC, I launched this message, and uh, it was something where God really spoke to my heart. And uh, I actually speak this uh, to this day at many camps around the world that I do. Um, I do a lot of camps over in, in Europe. I've done some down in Argentina. Um, yeah, but so many in the United States as God has given me the privilege to speak to young people. And uh, this is probably one of my favorite messages. If you're like, what are your top three? I would say this is definitely one of them. And um, I don't know about you, I love military history about special forces, you know, these. Yes, all right. <laughs> You know, some of the crazy things that these guys do, and you're like, that's almost unbelievable. It's so great. And, well, this is a passage of Scripture. We're going to start in verse 8 about King David's mighty men. And he had 37 of them, and they were called the 30, just like we would have the Navy SEALs. They were called the 30. You say, why were the 37 of them? Well, Perhaps there was 30 at one time, and then more were added, but the nickname 30 stuck. And if you were part of the 30, you were really something else. Josephus, the the, uh, uh, Israeli historian, has said that these men probably by themselves could have conquered nations. They were so great in their abilities. They are above and beyond in what they could accomplish. And David surrounded himself with these mighty men. And uh, I I love to study about them because uh, some of the exploits that they did are just so amazing to me. But what I love about this is that these men came to David to fight. They wanted to be with David because he was known as a really great warrior. You know, I'm sure they heard the story of David and Goliath when, you know, David was just a teenager. He was your age when he fought Goliath. Goliath, the champion of the Philistines. And, and uh, you know, the Philistines were kind of like gladiator fighters. They were one-on-one fighters. Uh, and they loved to see who's the best. And David took on the best of the best. And he defeated them as a, as a warrior. And so as he grew in his fame as the king of Israel, many men came to fight with him. They, they weren't all Israelites. There was Uriah the Hittite. There was a Moabite. There was an Ammonite. And uh, there was even in his bodyguard, he he had uh, Philistines and people from Crete. And so men from all over the world came to fight with King David because he was so great a warrior. And uh, I don't know about you, but I feel that way about King Jesus. You know, Jesus, when he died on the cross, I like in Isaiah 53, it says, because he did this, because he took the sins of many, He paid for the trespasses of all. Because he did this, he shall be numbered amongst the strong, and his name will be named amongst the great. And that's my Jesus. And I I don't know about you, I got saved when I was 15. And uh, I grew up in a very religious home. I knew about Jesus, and you know, but I'll tell you what, I, I got to the point where I'm like, I'm sure Jesus doesn't care about me because as a teenager, as I grew, I got deep into pornography, and I, you know, I was starting to lose any kind of semblance of goodness. And uh, I also had a super anger problem. Uh, I grew up on a farm, you know, and, and you know, since I was like eight years old, my, my dad was like, you're going to go out and feed cows and feed the calves. And I'm like, why do I have to do that? Well, you're a farmer, you know, and I'm like, ah, I ate this at six o'clock every morning, my mom would Kenny, get up. You got to feed the cows. I'm like, eh. I just want to go to school. No, I don't want to go to school. But anyways, I, you know, get up and feed the cows. And they would not cooperate. And I'm so angry. I have to be this farmer. And I just start cursing and swearing you. Blankety, blank, blank, cows, blank, 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 blank. You swore that many words in a row? Yes. And I'd get done just breathing heavily from such anger and wrath. And, I'd be, and I'm like, uh-oh, God. And I could just see God up there like, 
talk to the hand, you know what I mean? Ooh, you swore pornography, your filthy mind. And then I went to camp. A friend invited me to go to camp one day. And I go to camp, and the preacher got up there. He says, I'll bet you you kids swear and your parents don't know about it. I'm like, oh, yeah, how does, how does he know that? I'll bet you you're into pornography and nobody knows about it. I'm like, yes, I'm a secret agent pornography guy, you know. I mean, nobody knows about it. But he says, you know, God knows about it. And boy, I was struck with my guilt. But he said, Jesus. Died for you. And he can take it all away. All the guilt and the shame. And I was like, no, not me. It's so bad. And he said, no matter what you've done, Jesus can take it all. And the gospel became clear to me as a 15-year-old young man. And that night I dumped all my sin at the cross. And I found this forgiveness. And I'm telling you what, I was like, wow, God, the God of the universe loves me through Jesus. Jesus became my hero. I want to do anything for him. I'll tell you what, it was so neat last night watching Wayne with his dog. Wasn't that cool? You know, the dog came on there and, and the dog's laying down, but he's looking at Wayne like, you know, and, and remember he sat and said, you sit here, and he walked over and the dog's like, no, I want to be next to you, you know, and, and I was like, oh, don't you love dogs? They just like you, and they're like, anything I can do for you, you know, and, and you're my master, and you know what, when I got saved, that's how I felt about Jesus. What can I do for you? Man, I looked up. This is Jesus, my king, my, my lover, my savior, God, my father. Wow. I wanted to serve him. I went back home, told all the kids in my school. I, I just wanted to tell them, you don't have to work your way to heaven. It's a free gift. I just wanted to tell everybody. God, put that in my heart. I wanted to please him. And, and I, you know, and I look at these warriors, how they looked up to King David. I want to fight for King David. I'll do anything for him. I want to bring my best for him. And I'll tell you what, I, I don't know how your heart is today. I don't know if Jesus is just a casual friend or if you have that thing like, Jesus, I just want to meet you in the morning and pray to you. I want to just talk to you at night before I go to bed. I want to serve you. I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything for you. That was these men. So if you're taking notes this morning, I just want to talk about three character qualities we need to copy to please our King Jesus. Three character qualities. We're going to look at the three mighty men, the, the three in the top echelon of this great warrior. It's called the 30. Three character qualities we need to copy to please our King Jesus. I think these men had honed their skills and they stood by their king because they loved him. They wanted to fight for him. They wanted to please him. So we're going to look at three men. There was three echelons of these mighty men. You had the top three, then you had the middle two, and then the 32 at the bottom. They were all great men, but it said the three were the greatest of all of them. And so I want to look at the three greatest and kind of look at the, the characteristics they had, the, the character qualities. And as we think about, do I have those in my life? And may God speak to your heart and say, Jesus, help me to have such a love for you. Like that dog who looked up to Wayne last night. And just, he just loved his master. And we're like, I'll do anything for you. I just want to be by your side like these men. So let's look at verse 8 of 2 Samuel 23. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joshabashabeth, a Tachmanite. He was chief of the three. He wielded his spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. Now as I read these three names to you, the first one is Joshabashabeth, the second one will be Eliezer, and then Shammah. And I believe as you look at, there's also in uh, First Chronicles chapter 11, there's also a kind of a parallel passage with, about these guys. 
And it seems like they were all in a lentil field or a barley field when, when they received this fame. I, I think, I'm, I'm just conjecturing that that's the way it was. But in a couple of these cases here, it says that all the men of Israel had run away and left them by themselves. And so I envision the fact that I don't think David ever ran away from a battle. And so I think King David stood. I think Joshua Bashabeth stood. I think Eliezer stood and Shammah stood. And I think those four men stood and fought off the Philistine army by themselves until I think the Philistine army gave up because these men were so good that they retreated. So the first one is Joshua Bashabeth. He said he killed 800. He wielded a spear against 800 at one time and destroyed 800. And so here's the first character quality. Number one, I want to be a warrior of capacity. Number one, I want to be a warrior of capacity. Or if you want to write down, I will be a warrior of capacity. What does that mean? Well, you know, as, I, as I've grown and lived and walked through life, I see some people have a greater capacity than others. Like my wonderful wife that I met here at CSU. Man, thank you, God, for this beautiful, wonderful woman you brought to me here at, the, at this university to meet and to marry. I mean, I know God brought her here especially for me. My wife has such a capacity to do work. She never gets depressed, and I mean that. You know, some people go through the blues. I think there's been like three days I've seen her get down for about half a day, and then she'll be like, oh, I, I don't want to be like that anymore. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, wow. Me, I spent half of my first half of my life like I wish I were dead, you know. I mean, always depressed. My wife had the capacity for happiness and energy, and, man, she gets up in the morning, and she's got her list. She goes, and she grinds through it, you know. And then she says, I'm tired, I'm going to bed. You know, and she gets up the next morning. You know. Me, I lay in bed and suck my thumb. You know, I'm like, oh, I got all this stuff to do. Uh, you know. Some people have a large capacity. And, and I think one of the things God is always going to be doing in your life so he can use you in a great way is to increase your capacity. Now, he takes weak people like me who have a weak spirit. He's like, I need to toughen you up. He started at the age of 14. I remember when we, age of 14, we sold all our milk cows. I was like, yes, no more cows. My uncle came uh, to have Sunday dinner with us and my dad, we were sitting on the porch waiting for dinner and, and uh, my dad said, hey, uh, Jim, you got any, uh, you gonna be making hay this summer? He goes, oh, I got a lot of hay to make. I got 100 cows. He goes, you can have Kenneth. I was like, what? I don't want to make hay. He goes, you know, I mean, my dad's not going to let me sit around. Now, I'm the type, I can sit around and watch TV all day and not feel guilty, okay? But God's like, Ken Rudolph, I don't want you to be lazy. You're going to be a pastor someday. And so he put me on this farm, and my uncle's like, okay, we've got to make all this. And I'll tell you what, year by year, I mean, I used to get sick to my stomach. i got to go bail hay, and I don't want to do it. But I kept going back, and every year, God, I did this for five summers. And I remember how God grew my capacity to the point where I really enjoyed baling hay. I'm like, man, let's get the hay in the barn. And my Uncle Jim, I can still see him standing on the tractor there, like pumping his fist. This is beautiful hay. And I'm like, yeah, you know. And, and he's baling the hay, and I'm taking it back by myself, putting it in the barn, come back at another wagon load. And I remember the greatest day we ever had, we bailed and put in the barn 1,400 bales by our J Uncle Jim and me by ourselves. I didn't get home till 12 o'clock at night. We, I was like, we got to get it all in the barn because I, I want to start with empty wagons the next day. We had more hay to bale. I come home. My dad's waiting up for me. What'd you do today? Midnight. I'm like, we put 1,400 bales in the barn. He goes, yeah. My son's grown in capacity. Man, I thought it made me tough. And I remember one time I was, like I said, I used to travel to many camps, and I got to this one camp that had horses, and, and this tractor drives by me with a baler and an empty wagon, and there's eight staff members sitting on this wagon. And they stopped for a minute. I said, what are you guys doing? They're like, 
we're going to go out and bale hay because we have horses. I'm like, oh, wow. They said, we have to make 300 bales of hay. So there's eight of us. I was like, ooh. <laughs> Wimps, you know. <laughs> we, we need 800, 300 bales, eight of them. I'm like, come on, I put 1,400 in a barn by myself. One day, capacity. Thank you, God. And I think Joshua Bashabeth was someone, when everybody else ran away, he there with his spear. Now, the spears back then were not long with, with little spearhead on it. They had a two-foot spearhead and a two-foot handle. And he said he wielded his spear. It means he, he boy, he could move that thing. He was kind of like, probably like a ninja guy. You know, and he's like, come on. Now, you're like, now, okay, if everybody had run away, wouldn't the Philistines just surround him and kill him? No, because you, you got to understand, the, the, the Philistines were gladiator fighters. They would never come and stab somebody in the back. They wanted to face them one-on-one. -on -one. And if I can take out this brave man, that means I'm braver. And so they would, they would have lined up. Everybody runs away, and here's Joshua Bashabeth. Come on. Now, he had been practicing. He had been, God had been growing him in his capacity so he could take on not one. You know, I can see, first one, come on, they're lined up in a line. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Out, you know. And they're falling, and he's moving down the line. And after 800 of them, I'm sure the guy's like, you know what? We better leave this guy alone. And they laughed. And when he's done, he has 800. 800. What are you going to do for Jesus? Oh, Jesus, if you could increase my capacity, I can do great things for you. You know, God, I know I'm weak. I know I quit all the time. I give up. You know, everybody's accusing your generation of being weak. Aren't you sick of that? Amen. Start saying, God, take your Holy Spirit and strengthen me in my inner being that Christ might dwell in my heart by faith, that I, being rooted and grounded in love, might be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the height and the width and the length and the depth of your love, to know this love that surpasses knowledge that I may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's the kind of warriors we need today. I remember at Lake Ann Camp a number of years ago, I was telling everybody how great God was. And this counselor said, man, I got, I got an angry camper wants to talk to you. And I sat down with her and she was, had her arms crossed, scowl on her face. And I sat down over there at a bench under a tree, and I said, well, how can I help you? She says, you've been telling me God is good. I'm like, yeah. She says, well, I'll tell you what, I'm a foster child. You want me to tell you what happened to me? She says, I've been physically abused. I've been sexually abused. I've been verbally abused. I've been locked in closets with no light and darkness, no food. She says, I've been so, and she went on this list, and I was like, and halfway through, she goes, and don't tell me like those stupid social workers that you know how I feel because you don't know how I feel. And I'm sitting there, man, I'm disarmed. What can I tell her? I've been saying God is good. And she's like, yeah, you haven't walked in my shoes. And I tell you, I, I didn't know what to say to her. But then the Holy Spirit gave me an idea. And I said, I said, okay. I said, now, I want you to just think with me for a minute. I said, you have gone through things that I don't think hardly anybody's gone through. I mean, it was horrible. I said, but let me ask you something. Let's say you, you believe that God is good and that all things work together for good. Like Joseph said, you know, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I said, let's say you walk with God. You give God a chance in your life. And I said, you become a social worker. And you're sitting at your desk and someday this little girl walks in and says, I've been sexually abused and physically abused and verbally abused. I've been locked in closets and tortured and, and uh, gone without food. And, and, uh, and, and, and she says, you don't know how I feel. I said, what can you tell that little girl? And all of a sudden that girl, she put her arms down and she, I could see that her face brightened up. She says, I can tell her I know how she feels. I said, can I tell you what? You have the capacity 
to serve God like maybe no other person or young lady could ever serve him and meet the needs of a hurting generation like you. Listen, sometimes we take some of the horrible things that have happened to us, the tough things, and we're like, God, why? And maybe it's, he says, because I want you to grow in capacity to be able to consume the hurt of others, to stand up for Jesus, to fight for him, and tell the world he is good, that he died for your sins, and he's the healer. By his stripes we are healed. Amen? I'll tell you what, some of you are sitting here like, yeah, nobody knows the hurt that I've had. Listen, Jesus knows. He knows all the hurt and the shame because he took everything from the world, all that shame, hurt, pain, wickedness, evil, and he took it on himself at the cross to give you the capacity to go into a world and preach the gospel. And so Joshua Bashabeth, oh, he was a man of capacity. 800 in one time. Woo! Do you have that? May God give you capacity. Number two, verse 9, next to, him among the, uh, next to him among the three mighty men was Eliezer, the son of Dodo. How would you like a father with the name of Dodo? Son of Ohihi. He was with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle. And the men of Israel withdrew. He rose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary. And his hand clung to the sword, and the Lord brought about a great victory that day. And the men returned after him only to strip the slain. Number two, you ready? Number two, I will be a warrior of perseverance. Number two, I will be a warrior of perseverance. Wow. That simply means not to give up. Number two, I will be a warrior of perseverance. I will be a warrior of perseverance. Well, how did Eliezer get his fame? He had his sword there, said everybody had run away, but he did not run away, and he kept fighting. You know, I, it was probably hours, because again, the Philistines, they would have lined up one-on-one. He's like, ching, 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 ching. Now, after a while, you hold a sword out like that, your arm gets tired. The muscles start cramping up. And you're like, you know, ah, 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 just kill me. It hurts. He's like, it hurts, but I'm not giving up. Because there was something inside him. He had carried. Oh, look. I'm not giving If I give up, I'm dead. I'm not giving up for King David. Now, you're like, what do you mean? His hand stuck to a sword. Some say his hand was frozen to a sword. Now, I was at uh, church one time as a little boy. Did you ever hear a boring sermon? Okay. You know what I'm talking about. And I'm sitting next to my cousin, and he's like, hey, you want to do something cool? You know, I'm like, sure. He said, take my fingers and squeeze as hard as you can for five minutes. I'm like, why? He said, just do it. It's cool. All right, so. Five minutes, I squeeze his fingers. After five minutes, he was looking at his watch, and he pulls his finger out, slaps my wrist. Try to open your hand. It wouldn't open. And in the middle of church, I'm like, I can't open my hand, you know. My mother's up in the choir loft, like, is that Kenny? No. And my cousin, like, shh. I'm like, oh, yeah, it'll open after a while. That was five minutes, you know. Now, don't start trying that where you're sitting, you know. <laughs> hey, you know. Eliezer's got this sword. Ching, ching, ching. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll never give up until they, they ran away. And they're like, ah. And said the other was they came back only to spoil the dead, you know, and they come back like, <gasps> Nikes, all right, you know, <laughs> a Hollister shirt, you know. <laughs> Eliezer standing there with his sword, blood and sweat, and grime and exhaustion. 
and they're all picking the dead bodies. And they're like, you can put your sword away now, Eliezer, they're gone. He goes, I can't. <laughs> no, really, they're gone. I can't. It's stuck. And the word spread. You see, Eliezer, he can't let go of his sword. He fought so hard and so long, it stuck to his hand. I can see him sitting around the campfire that night with the rest of the soldiers, you know, and people keep sneaking up to stay there. There he's over there. He's talking. Ching. Oh, sorry. You know. <laughs> Could you roast these hot dogs for us? Yeah, sure. You know, got nothing else to do. Gets in his bed that night in a sleeping bag. You're like, oh, that was a 50 degree below zero sleeping bag. And everybody's like, look at that. Why? Why can't he fought until his sword froze to his hand? Wow. He never gave up. I tell you what, we need, look, look at me, look at me. We need young people today that will never give up. We are so weak in our spirit nowadays. A little speed bump in the road, and we're like, you know, we're not climbing mountains. We're like giving up at the speed bump. Oh, oh. And God's like, I need somebody who's going to fight until their sword, the sword of the spirit, sticks to their hand. Amen. And you go to your schools and preach about Jesus and not give up. And you get persecuted and blamed and bullied and I don't know what else, but we need young people that won't give up. That's one of the greatest lessons God ever taught to me before he would let me walk into the ministry because I was a perpetual quitter. And God put me in a job that taught me, don't you give up, don't you give up. Don't. And finally, when I stepped into the ministry, can I tell you what? I became a pastor, things got tough, but I was like, I know one thing I learned, Jesus, you don't stop. You never give up. And when you go home, don't you give up. You skip your devotions one time, just say, God, I'm sorry, I'm gonna do it tomorrow. And you get back in and do it, amen? Don't you give up, persevere. There's another wonderful soldier here, verse 11. Next to him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herahite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot of ground full of lentils or barley. And the men fled from the Philistines, but he took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines, and the Lord worked a great victory. The Lord worked a great victory. Number three, I will be a warrior of honor. Number three, here's a third character quality we need to please our Jesus. Number three, I will be a warrior of honor. A warrior of honor. Now, what do I mean by that? You know what? We need young people that, you know, some of you are like, I can't find value in my life. Got to tell you, sometimes there'll be people who will never tell you, tell you that you have value. One of the most precious moments just a couple weeks ago, I said I was at my 50 year high school reunion. My seventh grade English teacher came up and, and she patted me, ooh, sorry, she pat, patted me on the cheek and she goes, Kenny, uh, you're special. Don't you ever let anybody tell you. I had waited 56 years for a teacher to tell me I was special. Do I have value? I mean, I wept like a baby. But I'll tell you what, there's things you can do every day to realize you can be a person of honor and have that sense of value. Shama was told, you go, I can just see King David saying, Shama, go over and defend the lentil field. Do not leave. And it says he's over there and they all ran away. And he, ching, 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 you know, and come, come back, guys. Come. Oh, ching, ching, ching. oh no, they're all, I got to, and at the end of the battle, I can see King David, it's like, I wonder, wonder, Joshua, best you okay? Eliezer, yeah, and he runs to the top of the hill, look down into that lentil field, and he gets there, and he looks down, there's one man standing, it's Shama, he's all by himself, he's like, I didn't run, I stood up for what was right. He was a man of honor. Can I tell you what? 
if we're the kind of people that will stand in the midst of persecution and danger and not run away and defend the Word of God. Do you believe the Bible's the Word of God? Do you? I'll tell you what, when I was a teenager, I went back and told my school, like, yeah, man, I got saved, and the Bible says you don't have to work your way to heaven. And, and I was telling the gospel, and all of a sudden, my friend's like, wait a minute. Who says that's God's word? That's a book written by man. Man, did I get a kick in the face. Because I grew up in a home where we believe the Bible. I'll tell you what, I went on a journey, a journey which the Holy Spirit took me through a lot of studies and a lot of praying. And, and, but I'll tell you what, I believe this is God's word. The, the word of God from the creator of the universe that tells you how to live, tells you what the truth is. And the world is looking for something that's going to give them value and meaning. And here it is right here. I'll tell you what, I believe this. And some of you, you don't know if you're ready to defend it. But Shama, he knew his king and he's like, I'll stand and defend my king and I'll stay where he told me to stay. I will not leave. I'll tell you what, there's times... I was tempted like, I don't know. But can I tell you what? I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen? I believe the Bible's the Word of God. I believe that God hears every prayer that I say. Can I tell you, God's taken me on a journey of faith. But as I stand and defend His Word and defend my God and my Savior, I'll tell you what, I feel like I'm a man of honor. I have a sense that I did what was right. And when heaven and earth passes away, and all these people who rejected it, which is to me is a horrible thing to think that they will be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. At least I can stand in heaven and say, I know I stood for the truth and I did not run. Listen, do not let the secular humanists of the day in your schools tell you there is no God. Don't let them tell you that Jesus was just an historical figure. He's the son of God. Don't let them tell you the Bible is just a, a book written by man. It was written by the Spirit of God, and we have it. And you can stand and be a person of honor as you defend the truth of the world, like Wayne was talking about last night. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, man, that's what, man, I'll tell you what. When you stand for what's right, then you have honor. Well, we're not done. I pray that you'll be a person of honor. I pray that you'll stand for the Word of God. And if you meet, need to make those decisions about God's truth and about His Son, maybe you need to make those today. But I like the story that continues on after we learn about these three men, a man of capacity, a man of perseverance, and a man of honor. There's this beautiful story starting in verse 13. And three of the 30 chief men went down and came about harvest time to David at the cave of Adullam. Now I want you to know, the cave of Adullam was a very special place to King David. It was a place where he, uh, when he was being chased by King Saul, he went for refuge and he hid there. And it became a place for him like when he was outside of the palace, when he was outside of Jerusalem, he would use this out in the field as kind of a headquarters and where they gathered. And so they're getting ready for a battle with the Philistines. And so they came to him at harvest time to David at the cave of Adullam when a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, meaning the cave. That was his favorite cave. Uh, and so he was in that stronghold. And the garrison of the Philistines was then at Bethlehem. Now, let me ask you, what was Bethlehem to David? It's his hometown, okay? So they're in the cave, and I think he's got his 37 mighty men around him. And, and I think they're making plans about this battle. And the Philistines are over in Bethlehem. Remember that. Verse 15. And David said longingly, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. Now, they're out in the field. He's probably got some water in these goat skins. You know, they used to put water in goat skins. And, and uh, you know, and it would get warm. You know, they're out traveling. And... And they're in this cave getting ready for the battle. And David's like, you know, he'd been drinking this warm water and it's, you know, taking on the taste of goat skin. <laughs> and, he's, and they're like, okay, okay, guys, tomorrow. All right. But, and he looks at Bethlehem. He looks at the map where Bethlehem. And it makes him think about when he was a shepherd boy and he would come in from a long day of work. And there was this well by the gate of Bethlehem that was full of this cold, sweet water. It was a deep well. All that water had no sulfur in it, had no, 
Yeah. He's like, oh man, I'll tell you guys, he points there at Bethlehem, I wish I had a drink of water from the well by the gate of Bethlehem. I remember that. And they saw him longingly say that. He said, well, back to our battle plans, guys. And I can just see Joseph Bashabas stepping back and Eliezer, Shama, what? Let's go get him some water from that well. Our king, he wants it. Well, but that's where the Philistines are. You afraid? No. You? No. You want to go? Yeah. Yeah. Go get your spear. Get your swords. They strapped on their swords. Joshua Bashbeth got his spear. Let's go. Dun, 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 dun. I'm sure there was music, you know. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. They're walking into the heart of the enemy. The whole camp. The whole army. And they're like, we're getting some water for King David. He wants it. There's that well over by. And I can see that poor Philistine guard. Yo, who goes there? <laughs> we're Israelites. You, where's your white flag? We ain't got no white flag. We're coming in to get some water. And he goes, well, there's only three of you. Yeah, but we're the three mighty men. <gasps> oh, I remember you. And everybody's like, what? Where, where's the army? No, it's what, three guys? It's the three mighty men. <laughs> everybody, two arms, two arms. It's those three crazy guys. And they're like, oh, no. And they're like, and, and he goes, okay, ready? Joseph Bashabeth, ready, Shama? Eliezer, yeah, let's do the flying triangle. Okay. You know, yeah. And they start, here's mobs of guys, Philistine soldiers, and they're falling and they're wicking their way through. Their, yeah. They get to the well, go, Shama. Blah, 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 blah. Hurry up. And they're, I got it. They get to the edge of the camp. See you tomorrow. And they got the water. And I could just see them, guys. We got the water. Let's take it back to King David. And they, give, they get back to the cave, you know, and they... And David says, uh, yes, who is it? Um, Sir, it's the three mighty men. Oh, let them in. Let them come in. And they walk in. And, uh, Sir, we, we brought you some water. And he goes, well, men, I have water. Oh, well, uh, no, it's, uh, it's water from the well by the gate of Bethlehem. David's face. What? You men went there for me? You, that's where the army of the Philistines is. Well, there's a lot fewer of them, sir. <laughs> you, why? why? Oh, we knew you wanted some water. We'd do anything for you to please you. But man, that's a, shucks. For nothing. Right, guys? Yes, sir. And to see the look on his face. It was worth it all. It was worth it all. And young people, here's what I want to challenge you with today. We need some young people that will love Jesus so much. And have this thing in your heart, say, I want to please. Jesus, I'll go anywhere. I will go to my high school. In a few weeks, high school starts. And I haven't ever spoken up for you. I've never said anything. They don't know I'm a Christian. But I've come here this week, and you've set a fire in my heart. And I love you. And I've seen you like never before. I, 
Jesus, you're so beautiful and you're so glorious. And you're my king and I'd do anything for you and I need to step up and I want to. There's something in my heart and I, I hear the longing of your heart, oh, that someone would go to that high school and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. <gasps> Oh, that someone would go to Europe. I'll tell you, when, a couple, about 10, 12 years ago when I went to Europe, I saw how dark it was. And the cathedrals are nothing but museums and discos and restaurants. And they, they, the gospel isn't preached anymore. And the people, are, they don't believe in God. They're post-Christian. They're post-modern. They're post-everything that has to do with God. And I saw the darkness and at the age of 56, God spoke to my heart one Sunday morning in church. And he says, instead of thinking you're done and ready to retire, why don't you start the greatest work of your life? Go into the darkness. And I said, if nobody else will go, if no young person wants to, uh, let me tell you, if you go into a different culture, People that hate Jesus, they don't want to hear about Jesus. You walk into that darkness and try to tell people to say, uh, my son is a missionary over there, and he's about 30-some years old, and an older person told him, he said, you're the first young person I've ever met in my life who believes in God. How's that for a walking into the camp of the enemy? Oh, who will walk into a dangerous city like Tokyo? Who will walk into a dangerous, godless city like Buenos Aires? Who will walk into the dark cities of our world, London and Berlin and, and all these places and say, Jesus, I'll get you the water. Jesus, I'll go get you the souls. I'll tell you what, I, I, I hope someday. When I stand before my King Jesus, I will see the look on his face. What, you did this for me? Shucks. Poor nothing, Jesus. I love you. I want to please you. Do you want to please the king? Do you love him? I still think of Sasha the dog looking up to her master. You got something for me? He says, good dog. Oh, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, David, the end of that story says, David would not drink that water. He goes, oh God, this is so precious. Is not this water the blood of them who went in danger of their lives? And he poured it out to the Lord. Would you pour out your life? to Jesus we just say here it is all my dreams all my this, can I tell you what God called me to be a pastor at the age of 16 can I tell you the adventure it has been wow what a journey what I would not trade it for anything in the world it's not been born is it when I said Jesus you can have everything my parents were like don't be a pastor. They don't make money. The people told me, don't be a missionary. you got to raise your support. Don't, can I tell you what? God has walked me every step of the way, and he's helped me to be a, a, a greater capacity. He's given me perseverance. And I'll tell you what, I live with a sense of honor because I've lived for Jesus. Would you pour out your life today and say, Jesus, I'll go anywhere? Would you all just bow your heads and close your eyes? Just before I pray, I want to ask you, and I, I don't want this just to be some kind of a, yeah, I guess I could raise my hand, but if God has spoken to your heart and he has challenged you to go into the gut of the enemy and you're ready to pour out your life for him, would you raise your hand and say, God has spoken to my heart. Jesus, I'll go anywhere. 
Don't you raise your hand unless you mean it. Jesus, I see you as never before. I'll go where you want me to go. In fact, I think I'd like to live that way. I'd like to live dangerously for Jesus Christ. Would you raise your hand nice and high, nice and high? All right, do you mean it? Okay, you can put your hands down. I want to pray. Father, I want to pray for these young people. And I pray, Father, that they would, as you saw their hands that were raised, I just pray that you would fill them with your power. For the Holy Spirit is the one for the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead as if he is dwelling within us and he is then that same spirit who raised Christ from the dead shall also give life to our mortal bodies Father enable these mortal bodies to go into the host of the enemy and get that precious water get those precious souls for Jesus oh God we need a generation that is not weak a generation who is determined a generation the next generation who will say you can count on me Jesus I love you this is not a hollow commitment it's not empty I'm pouring my life out for you today oh Jesus raise up for us another generation like the generation that I came to CSU with and we said side by side shoulder to shoulder hand in hand we will go out and win the world to Jesus Christ God raise up a new generation of students that will come here or, or wherever you take them Father and train them to be warriors they might be mighty warriors of Jesus Christ and be written about in heaven I pray these things in Jesus name Amen I'd like you to do one more thing before close if you raise your hand and you really mean it you'd like to make a public profession that I'm giving it all to Jesus I'll go anywhere would you stand right where you are just stand up and say I'm making this commitment all right and everybody around them I, I want you to look at them and when you go home I want you to say you said you were gonna do this you keep them accountable amen dismissed.